Greetings, this is Ollie Apson. Welcome to this video. Um, I am currently isolating during the COVID-19 epidemic, and so I've put together a series of presentations that I've given online, um, and this is the first time I've tried to record one as a video um, for YouTube, so hopefully you will enjoy it. You might have to bear with me during the slightly less than optimum sound quality. That is because I don't have my decent microphone with me and all attempts to plug in the variety of microphones that I do have access to have failed. Okay, well, let's get started. Today we're going to be talking about aircraft engines. We are going to do a quick introduction to myself. We are going to then understand the need for aircraft engines. We're going to look at the development of aircraft engines. We are going to look at the different types of aircraft engines. And we're going to take a good look at a modern turbofan engine, in this case, one of the Rolls-Royce Trent series engines. I should add a caveat that I event I I should add a caveat that I originally put this presentation together for sort of school children age 12 up. So there won't be perhaps as much detail as some of my regular viewers might like. Uh, nonetheless, it should give you a good starting off point. And if you want to know more, feel free to chuck something in the comments below and I will get back to you. Oh, yeah, we're also going to have some fun. Um, yeah, my name's Ollie Epsom. I'm not going to dwell on this but too much. I'm a mechanical engineer. I've done a few things. I started off in the Royal Navy when I was a youngster. Um, then I actually did work for Rolls-Royce um, where I designed uh, nuclear reactors for submarines and also uh, parts of aircraft engines um, for a while. And now I mainly do renewable energy, wind turbines, wind farms and so on and so forth. Um, I'm going to make a lot of comments about Rolls-Royce engines in this presentation. Uh, I want to emphasize that that is not because Rolls-Royce is paying me. They are not. Uh, they used to years ago. Uh, it's merely because they're the engines I know the most about because they were the ones that I work with uh, the most. And also, of course, they are the best ones because yours truly had a hand in them. OK, let's get started. Um, why do we need engines on aeroplanes? Uh, this might be preaching to the choir for most of my viewers, but on the assumption that it isn't, uh, here is a diagram of an aeroplane. Um, we have four main forces acting on it. So first of all, we've got the weight, which is dragging the aeroplane down to the ground. Uh, that's caused by gravity, of course. Um, in order to make an aeroplane fly, we need lift. Now the lift is created by the wings, and that is what pulls the aeroplane up into the air. So the lift and the weight must exactly balance each other out. If the weight is bigger than the lift, then the airplane falls. If the lift is bigger than the weight, then the airplane climbs. The way that we generate lift on an aeroplane is by moving through the air. So the movement of the air over the wings of the aeroplane um, creates a lift um, by um, accelerating the airflow over the top of the wing, um, which creates a lower pressure there. And the difference in pressure between the bottom of the wing and the top of the wing um, creates the lift. Um, but that only happens at relatively high speed, so we need to get the airplane moving fast enough in order that the lift is sufficient to get the airplane off the ground. Um, and that's basically what's happening when you're on a takeoff roll. So obviously, as you know, when you ride a bike or drive, um, you roll to a stop quite quickly when you stop putting power in. That is because the drag from the air slows you down. So air is actually a thing. It's all around us. It's quite dense. It creates an awful lot of drag and stops us from moving. Now, in order to overcome that drag, we need thrust, which is some means of pulling us through the air. On a bicycle, it's you. On a car, it's the engine. On an aeroplane, it is the propeller or jet engine that drives the aeroplane forwards. So the engines are needed in order to generate thrust, which drags the airplanes through the air and counteracts the drag force. And we need to drag the airplane through the air in order to create airflow over the wings, which creates lift. And that lift is needed to counteract the weight of the aircraft and therefore get the aircraft into the air and make it fly. So that's a very basic um, introduction to the forces acting on an airplane. Um, 
for the rest of this presentation, we are going to focus only on the engine. People often ask me why we need engines. Why can't we fly? Um, in the short answer is that humans are just not strong enough. Uh, over here on the left, we have some classical painting of the Greek myth of Icarus. Now, Icarus and his father were trapped in a labyrinth and um, with a monster. And they managed to escape, so the myth goes, by building wings out of dead birds and gluing the wings together with wax, simply strapping the wings to their arms and flapping away like little birds. And of course, Icarus flew too close to the sun. Well, you and I know that's not possible, never mind flying, but I mean, the sun is eight and a half light minutes away, so he'd have been doing quite good to fly close to it. But anyway, and uh, his wings melted and he plunged to his death. Um, obviously, the, it is a myth, it's nonsense. Um, the reason that we couldn't do this, and people throughout history have probably tried and mostly died doing it, is because um, humans are just not strong enough. It's not just that our arms aren't strong enough, it's that our cardiovascular systems aren't strong enough for prolonged human-powered flight. There are sort of pedal-powered aircraft that have been relatively successful, and some of them have travelled marathon distances, but they can only do it in very controlled atmospheric conditions, in-ground effects with very, very skilled, uh, highly trained cyclists um, operating them. Um, we're, we're not really got the, the stamina to, uh, to do it long term, unlike birds, which have. Now, birds have numerous innovations on their skeletons that make them ideally adapted to flight, and they should be because they've evolved for several millions of years to do it. First off, they're very lightweight. Their bone structures are much more lightweight than us. Second off, they have massive breast muscles um, in their core, which help to flap their wings. And thirdly, they have recirculating lungs. So the air actually goes into the lung one way and comes out the other way, unlike us, where it comes in and out the same pipe. And that makes them much better at metabolizing oxygen. Uh, there's a whole load of other reasons why birds can fly and we can't. I could make the same arguments for insects, bats, and so on. But in general, um, those are animals that have evolved for millions and millions of years to fly. And we have evolved for millions and millions of years to grab around in the sand and, you know, kill each other, uh, which is what we're very good at. So we can't fly. In the early days of the Industrial Revolution, many people experimented with aircraft. Um, mostly they used steam power. Uh, none of them worked. Uh, it's difficult to find good quality photos of that era for fairly obvious reasons. Um, but here in 1894, Hiram Maxim, who's more famous for inventing the Maxim machine gun, uh, had a go. Um, he built this giant. You could just about see a person here for scale. It had a 180 horsepower steam engine, which is the boiler of which is here. Um, and it was a pretty impressive steam engine for the time, you know, the power to weight ratio wasn't bad, but the engine still weighed about a thousand kilos um, and the rest of the plane weighed around 2000 kilos. So I think the total weight was over 3000 kilos, that's three tons. And um, of course, with 180 horsepower, that wasn't going to go anywhere. And even if it had, it wouldn't have been controllable. So the power to weight ratio of this plane was um, nowhere near sufficient to take off. Um, but, you know, give the guy credit, he spent his fortune on it and, uh, yeah, um, kept him occupied, I suppose, and away from his wife. Um, but, yeah, even if it had taken off, he hadn't really given any thought of how to control it, so it would have crashed instantly anyway. Uh, the Wright brothers were the guys who solved the problem in 1903, and I could talk for hours about the Wright brothers because I think they were incredible people. I think they were basically the best engineers that ever lived. I think they're criminally underrated. And if you scan YouTube, you'll find hundreds and hundreds of videos telling you that the Wright brothers didn't invent the airplane, uh, that they copied everybody else, that some guy somewhere else did it beforehand or whatever. And uh, I have to say, from what I have researched on the subject, uh, none of that is true. Um, they really were visionary engineers. They put their entire fortunes into this. They didn't just um, invent aircraft. They sold lift, controllability, power and weight all at the same time, um, which was an impressive achievement. Um, and 
they didn't mess about with it. So yeah, I would quite like to go on about them more, but to save me the trouble, um, I've put a link in the description to an excellent video by one of my favorite YouTubers, Greg's Aeroplanes and Automobiles, who, uh, who can tell you more about it. Now, they designed and built this engine themselves, um, and it was a revolutionary design at the time, and it would still be familiar to any mechanic now. It had overhead cams, it had an aluminium block, um, it produced about 18 horsepower for 82 kilos, so that's a you know, obviously now is a pretty rubbish um, power to weight ratio, but at the time it was very good. And uh, that was enough for them to take off in Kitty Hawk. Um, as you'll find from Greg's video and others on the subject, there was a, a number of reasons why they were successful on that particular day, um, mainly related to atmospheric pressure and wind conditions. But nonetheless, they were successful and of course um, went on to be incredibly successful and make a well-earned and well-deserved amount of money so good for them since the wright brothers uh, we've had a hundred or so years of development um, of engines um, and modern engines are thousands of times more powerful than the wright brothers um, they're only tens to hundreds of times heavier um, and they use significantly less fuel per horsepower or unit of thrust created um, perhaps most impressively, they can operate for months with very minimal maintenance and they are extremely reliable. Um, I've just put a few engines here just to show, obviously the Wright Brothers engine here at the bottom. Um, this engine here at the top left is a Rolls-Royce Neen, which is accidentally uh, probably the most produced turbojet engine of all time. Um, it's a 1950s engine that Rolls-Royce didn't actually produce that many of. Um, what they did was sell it to the Russians. I think they sold six copies to the Russians who proceeded to copy them and make about 30,000, um, including in most MiG-15s. Um, and when the Russians had finished with it, they sold it to the Chinese who proceeded to make about the same number as well. So, um, yeah, it was probably... Britain's greatest contribution to the wrong side of the Cold War, really. Uh, but nonetheless, it was a very good, very successful engine, well designed. Um, here we have a Wright turbo compound, which was one of the final sort of piston engines. I'm not going to talk much about piston engines in this talk, but um, piston aircraft engines are interesting in their own right and were pushed to a very high level of development that essentially reached a dead end in the late 40s when jets took over. Um, one of the big advantages of jets in those days was actually their relative reliability. Um, it wasn't unusual for a piston engine aircraft in the 1940s to take off with four engines and land with two or three, um, which just was the way things were. Uh, here is the TP400, which is the most powerful turboprop in production today. There are more powerful turboprops flying on the Russian Bear bomber, but they're not built anymore. Uh, the TP400s are on the A400M tactical, uh, sorry, strategic airlifter, and they're around 14,000 horsepower each, and there's four of them. Um, they actually have opposite turning um, engines on each wing to increase downwash to improve short takeoff performance uh, and so on. And here is the front of a modern uh, turbofan. This is a generic Rolls-Royce Trent. I actually can't remember which type. I should know, but I don't. Um, but the point I'm making is that we've had 100 years to get this right, and essentially we, we have. Um, there are different types of aircraft engine. Um, I'm not really going to talk about them all because um, it would take a long time, um, but I'll briefly mention the fact that up until the mid-1940s, the vast majority of airplanes had piston engines. Um, a piston engine is basically what's in your car, unless you drive an electric car. Um, and they were pushed to a high level of development. Uh, the piston engine would drive a propeller, which would usually be at the front of the aircraft or on the wings, and that would drag the airplane along. 
Now, you have seen propeller planes, and we still use propeller planes, but the chances are that unless you're on something very small, like a private aeroplane or a Britain Norman Islander or something like that, the chances are that that propeller is not driven by a piston engine. It's driven by a thing called a turboprop engine, which is a gas turbine, basically. It's like a jet engine with um, a propeller instead of a fan at the front. That might not mean anything to you because you haven't seen the rest of the presentation, but don't worry about it because I'm not going to be talking about turboprops in this presentation either. Uh, here I have shown a picture of Concorde, and the reason I've chosen Concorde here is because Concorde is a very good example of a plane that uses turbojet engines, and turbojet engines are the most simple type of jet engine. Um, they're generally not used that much anymore for reasons that will become apparent um, during the rest of this presentation. Um, but they are useful when you need to go very fast um, or alternatively when you want a simple, cheap disposable engine like in a cruise missile or something like that. Um, but there aren't, as far as I know, any operating airliners anymore with turbojets. There may possibly be a few military aircraft in the back of some guy's fleet somewhere that have them, but in general, they've gone the way of the dodo uh, due to efficiency, noise, and so forth. Uh, and then on the bottom left, I think we have um, a modern turbofan engine, which we will be basically concentrating on for the remainder of this presentation because turbofan engines are on essentially every civilian aircraft flying today with the exception of those driven by turboprop engines which are related and they are also in a slightly less radical form on most military aircraft uh, where they tend to use what's called a bypass engine which is essentially a turbofan engine but with a smaller fan. So how does a jet engine work? Well, luckily it is very simple. I've got here um, a Rolls-Royce Olympus 593 engine, which is a very simple two-spool turbojet engine. And this is the engine that operated on Concorde. Now, conveniently, this picture from a museum um, has cut holes in the um, side of it so we can actually see what's inside the engine and we can line that up with this diagram underneath it. Um, all of these aircraft engines have a four cycle system so in the parlance of engineering we generally say suck squeeze bang blow but the, um, the proper um, terminology is intake, compression, combustion and exhaust. Now, the difference between a jet engine and, say, a piston engine is that these stages happen continuously. So in a piston engine, these stages happen sequentially inside the cylinder of your engine. Um, so on one cycle, it's um, intake, then compression, then combustion, then exhaust. Um, but in a gas turbine, they take place continuously at different parts of the engine. What we're trying to do with a jet engine is make hot gas go out the back. That's our goal. Um, in order to make hot gas go out the back, we need to burn fuel with air. And when we burn fuel with air, it will just go everywhere. It, we don't have any control of it. So if we put it in a pipe and burn it, it will go out the front of the pipe and the back of the pipe. We don't want that. Um, we only want it to go out the back of the pipe. So what we have is we have a series of compressors at the front of the engine, and these compressors suck air in at the front, and they compress the air, and they compress and compress and compress. These compressors on this engine are in the form of rotating fans. Uh, in other engines, they might be centrifugal. Uh, for example, a lot of helicopter engines still use that technology. Um, and as the air is squeezed, it does get hot. You know, it gets up to about four or 500 degrees centigrade. It then enters the combustion chamber, which is where high pressure fuel is introduced. Um, and that high pressure fuel is atomized so that it mixes very well with the air that's rushing through. And because the air is hot, the fuel combusts and burns with the air. Now, it wants to expand and it wants to get out of where it is because it's expanding. It cannot go out the front of the engine 
because there's more compressed air coming in. So it goes the only way it can, which is out the back of the engine. On the way out, it goes through these turbine blades, um, which um, are rotated by the hot gas. And the rotation of those turbine blades means that the compressors, which are joined to the turbine blades by shafts, uh, spin. So effectively, the turbine blades are the turbine blades are driving the compressors. That's the only reason they're there. Now, obviously, most of the energy of the engine actually goes into driving the compressor, which sucks air in and compresses it, and um, drives the turbines that drive the compressor. So essentially, most of the en engine power um, is designed just to keep the engine going. And whatever you've got left goes out the back as hot gas, which is thrust. Um, so no matter how well you design your engine, you're always going to have to use an enormous amount of power to keep it going. Um, this is well understood in thermodynamics, and it's one reason why aircraft engines, although they're very good, and you're never anything like 100% efficient. You know, they might top out at 40, 50%, depending on how good they are. Um, so yes, we to summarize, we suck air in at the front, we compress it with compressors, we inject fuel into the combustion chamber, and because the compressed air is hot, it burns with the fuel. The fuel and air burns, creating hot gas. The gas cannot go out the front of the engine because more air is being pushed into it, so it goes out the back where the lower pressure is. Um, on the way out, it spins the turbine blades, and those turbine blades are what spins the compressor, which allows more air to come in. So it's very simple in principle and nothing complicated about that. In fact, when Sir Frank Whittle took the idea to Rolls-Royce, he was very pleased with the simplicity of the engine. Don't worry about that, said the guys at Rolls-Royce. We'll soon design the simplicity out of it. And that's what they do, because if it was that easy, what's all the fuss about, and why do, why do, why do people like me need to be paid to design them? Um, so early jet engines, and by those I mean the engines of the 40s, um, had a number of disadvantages. Uh, they had very, very high fuel consumption, and they, they were, had a low efficiency, mainly because they had a low pressure ratio and a low combustion engine temperature. They had short lives, especially the German ones. So here we've got a Mi 263 at the bottom, Messerschmitt 263. Now, many people on YouTube will wax lyrical about the revolutionary nature of this aircraft and how much more advanced it was than anything that the British or Americans had. And I've always taken a pretty, uh, pretty sceptical um, view of that. Um, it wasn't a bad aircraft, but the engines really were not up to the job. Um, not necessarily from a design point of view, it was more an access to strategic materials that meant that they didn't have enough nickel, and nickel is what you need if you want to make high temperature engines, so they had uh, quite a lot of disc failures, blade off incidents and so forth. Those engines would only run for about 10 hours before they'd need to be reconditioned, whereas the equivalent um, British engines uh, didn't really have that issue. You could argue they were less advanced, but at the end of the day, if it works, it works. Um, they also had very poor takeoff and landing characteristics, again, particularly the German engines, which used axial flow compressors, um, which are the type of compressors we saw in the previous slide. Um, it's actually very difficult to design axial flow compressors, and if you don't do it right at low speeds, the flow characteristics can break down, which gives you a very poor uh, throttle response. Um, many Mi-262s were shot down, and a lot of them were shot down during their takeoff or landing run when their behaviour was pretty unspeakable. Um, and I should emphasise, of course, they were shot down by piston engine fighters, which had a much lower performance in general. Uh, they also were screamingly noisy um, and could be heard for everywhere, basically. Um, so we decided to engineer the simplicity out of these early jet engines. Um, and there has been, as I say, 50, 60 years of development um, on these engines since, uh, since the 1940s when, when jet engines were first developed. Um, and modern engines are very, very good. So 
we have um, much more high temperature materials now. So to put that in context, the temperature in a modern jet engine is approaching 2000 degrees Kelvin at the um, turbine side. Now that is about 600 degrees higher than the temperature at which steel melts. Um, in order to operate at such high temperatures, we need special materials for the turbine blades and the nozzle guide vanes. And we also need cooling systems for them and coating systems. Um, we'll look into that a bit more later. Um, we've obviously got um, much more advanced aerodynamics now, thanks to computer modeling and wind tunnels and so on and so forth, um, which allow us to generate much more efficient flow patterns inside the engine um, and much more efficient blades. Um, manufacturing methods have improved. You know, we have computer numerical control machines, we have robotics, we have um, coordinate measurement systems that allow us to check what we have built, uh, various other mass production techniques. Um, we have much more highly refined subsystems, um, and you'll see a little bit about what that means later. So that really is um, engineering the simplicity out of it. So modern engines have 40 or 50 very complex subsystems and by that I mean things like the fuel system, the tip clearance control system, the oil system, the cooling air system, the starting system, the FADAC system and so on and so forth. Um, and perhaps uh, most significantly the development of high bypass turbofans um, which we'll be looking at uh, next. We also have multi-spool engines. Now a multi-spool engine just means that instead of having one turbine joined onto one compressor, um, we actually have several turbines connected onto several compressors, all operating at different speeds. And the way they do that is exactly the same way a clock works. So a clock has two hands which rotate at different speeds, and one shaft on the clock is inside the other shaft of a clock. Um, which is why I have a picture of a clock here. Obviously, an engine rotates thousands of times faster than a clock, but the principle is exactly the same. So here in this picture here, we have a sort of cutaway view of a three spool engine. So we have the high pressure turbine here, which is connected to the high pressure compressor via the high pressure shaft. And then behind that, we have the intermediate pressure turbine, which is connected to the intermediate pressure compressor, which is off screen by the intermediate pressure shaft. And then right on the inside of that, we have the low pressure compressor, which is connected to the, sorry, we have the low pressure turbine, which is connected to the low pressure compressor via the low pressure shaft. And each of those shafts rotates inside each other um, at different speeds and quite often in different directions to reduce the um, gyroscopic effects of the engine. Now, the advantage of a multi-spool engine is that your compressors can operate at their most efficient speed. So different parts of the compressor can operate at different speeds, which means that they can be more efficient at their job. Um, in principle, the more stages you have, the better your engine's going to be. But the vast majority of engines are two spool. Now, that means they have a high pressure and a low pressure turbine, uh, turbine and a high pressure and a low pressure compressor. <laughs> However, many engines are three spool. And the more spools you have, the shorter your compressor needs to be because it's operating in a more efficient manner. And that means that contrary to what you might expect, a three spool engine is actually shorter and lighter than a two spool engine. And a two spool engine is shorter and lighter than a single spool engine. The main benefit obviously of having a single spool or a two spool engine versus a three spool engine is simplicity. Oh, okay. I possibly should have run through this. Different parts of the engine, yes. Okay. So, what is a turbofan? Um, a turbofan is what powers most modern airlines. Now, when I showed you the diagram of how a jet engine works, I was essentially talking about a turbojet. On a turbofan engine, the jet engine is referred to part, is what is referred to as a core. So, I'm highlighting here the core of a turbofan engine. And that is the part of the engine which has the suck, the squeeze, the bang and the blow. So it has the compressor here, and then it has the other compressor here, and here's the combustion chamber, and then the turbines are at the back and the thrust comes out the back. 
The difference is that at the front of the engine, there's a large fan. Now that fan is powered by the low pressure compressor at the back of, sorry, I keep saying compressor instead of turbine. The fan is powered by the low pressure turbine at the back of the engine via a shaft, which runs all the way through the middle of the engine and is joined onto the fan. The fan blows air outside of the engine. So it's in effect, it's like a propeller. Now, you're probably going to ask me, why do I need a fan? Um, and the reason is that it's for subsonic aircraft, which is basically every civilian aircraft flying today. Um, the lower the velocity of the moving air, the quieter and more efficient it's going to be. So on a turbojet engine, you get a very small amount of air moving very fast, and that's great. You will fly, but it will be noisy and it will burn a lot of fuel. With a turbofan engine, because you've got a big surface area at the front of the engine from the fan, you can move an enormous amount of air, but relatively much more slowly. And that increases the efficiency very, very significantly. Um, it does mean that you have to design your core primarily for power takeoff and not necessarily for direct thrust. So the actual core of a turbine, a turbofan engine probably only produces about a fifth or less of the total thrust of the engine. The majority of thrust comes from the fan. Um, in addition, turbofan engines are classified by what is called their bypass ratio. And the bypass ratio is the quantity of air that goes outside the engine um, versus the quantity that goes through the inside. So a bypass ratio of five to one means five times as much air goes around the outside of the engine as through the core. Uh, 10 to one, 10 times as much goes through the outside of the core. Now, I alluded earlier to military engines, which are typically bypass engines. They are exactly the same as turbofan engines. It's just they generally have a much lower bypass ratio. So instead of seven to one or eight to one on a modern turbofan, they might have two to one or three to one, or even one to one on something like um, an F-15 engine. Um, and on the uh, left here, you can see um, a computer generated image of what a turbofan looks like. And as you can see, the core of the engine at the back or in the middle, um, is the bit that's doing all the sort of jet engine work and at the front you have a fan. I mentioned turboprop engines earlier which are the propeller type planes which I said were driven by a gas turbine. A turboprop in concept is exactly the same as a turbo fan except instead of having a fan at the front it has a propeller and what a propeller is is an even bigger amount of even slower moving air. So that's how a turboprop works. <laughs> Right now, we're going to look at a Rolls-Royce Trent series engine. Um, again, I don't work for Rolls-Royce anymore, and they're not paying me to make this, but they do make very good engines. Um, I'm sure that in so doing, I will be engulfed by a sea of armchair experts who will tell me that General Electric or Pratt & Whitney or whatever are so much better than blah de blah de blah um, You're more than welcome to your incorrect opinion. That's fine. Keep it. Um, I'm going to talk about the Trent series engines because they're good engines. They're three spool engines. Uh, the main features of the three spools and the high reliability and high efficiency. And they're used on many different types of planes. So they're used on the Boeing 787. They're used on the Airbus A350. They're used on the Airbus A380. They're used on the Airbus A340. They're used on the Airbus A330. Not only that, but before the Rolls-Royce Trent series entered the aviation world in the early 1990s with the Trent 700, which is on the early A330 aircraft, um, we had the RB211 engines, which were the Trent engine's predecessors, and they entered service with the Lockheed TriStar um, back in the 1970s. Um, they also found their way onto the Boeing 747, the Boeing 757, the Tupelo 204. I believe there might even have been a few on a few 767s, but uh, I might be talking out of turn there. Basically, this architecture of engine has been quite a successful large aircraft engine. 
Um, obviously, it's not perfect. Uh, no engines are. Um, in particular, the Trent 1000 engine on the Boeing 787 has had a lot of in-service problems, uh, mainly in my opinion, and it is just an opinion because Rolls-Royce overpromised on specific fuel consumption um, figures and then had to really push the engine. But um, yeah, they're a good engine um, and they are um, still in production today and were, are likely to stay in production for a long time. Um, here is a cutaway um, of a Trent 500 engine. Now, this is actually the smallest of the Trent series engines, and it's out of production. It was actually designed for the Airbus A340, which is 600, which is also out of production. Um, because four engine aircraft are no longer economic for a whole load of reasons that I'm not going to get into now. Um, the main reason for showing you this slide is just to give you a, an idea of the complexity of these things in real life. So I've up till now shown you very sort of simple stylized views of, you know, suck, squeeze, bang, blow. We have a few injectors and so on. Um, but actually, these are incredibly complex machines and you could do a PhD on one small section of the engine and then move 30 centimeters along the engine and somebody else will have done a PhD on that bit. And you can pick any one of these, any part on this engine and the cleverest, most knowledgeable people in the world will have been involved in it. Um, and it, it never fails to amaze me. Um, a feature of Rolls-Royce engines is that most of the ancillaries are fan case hung. So what that means is uh, oil pumps, fuel pumps and so forth are hung on the outside of the fan case, which is the part that goes on the outside of the fan, rather than the outside of the core. Um, now that has advantages and disadvantages. One of the big advantages is that it's easier to get at them for maintenance. Um, a disadvantage, you could argue, is that it makes the engine slightly fatter, um, but aerodynamically that's not as bad as it sounds. Um, as you can see, it is a relatively short engine. If this was a two-spool engine, it would probably come out to about here, at least, um, due to compressor inefficiencies. Now, being a three-spool engine, it has a low-pressure turbine, which is this section in red. That drives the low pressure compressor but on the Rolls-Royce Trent series engines the low pressure compressor is the fan so the fan itself slightly compresses a little bit of air that enters the core and then after that it meets the intermediate pressure compressor and um, uh, and the intermediate pressure compressor is driven by the intermediate pressure turbine um, via the intermediate pressure shaft and so on and then we get the high pressure compressor and then the high pressure turbine intermediate pressure turbine low pressure turbine and out the back and so on these trent three spool engines the fan is the low pressure compressor um, if we look at some components that go into these engines, I can't possibly go into all of them, um, but just to give you an idea of the complexity, here is a high pressure turbine blade. Now the high pressure turbine blade is one of the most complicated and expensive parts on the engine because it's operating at the highest temperature at the highest stress. As I say, on a modern engine, it can be up to 2000 Kelvin. Um, they are primarily made of nickel alloys or more advanced materials than that that I wouldn't tell you about even if I knew. Um, because nickel melts at a very high temperature. It's also extremely expensive. Now, it's not just a case of making a hunk of nickel in the shape of a turbine blade. Um, you will notice on these turbine blades, there's um, a series of tiny little holes on the blade. Um, and that is because the blade is operating at a temperature that is higher than its melting point. So even though it's nickel, which is a very high temperature material, um, is still operating outside of its melting point. So obviously we can't have the blade melt. So what happens, um, as you can see here on the picture on the left, is the inside of the blade has cooling channels built into it. And air from the compressor is pumped into those cooling channels and oozes out the holes on the side of the turbine. And that creates a kind of sheath around the actual blade itself. So the hot gas from combustion never actually directly touches the turbine blade. 
and that's what keeps it cool enough to avoid melting. Um, in addition, um, there's a lot of other very clever stuff with these blades. So modern blades are usually co coated in a ceramic coating, which is a bit like a ceramic is essentially a high tech version of what your pottery is made out of in the kitchen. Um, and that allows it to operate at a slightly higher temperature still. Um, they're also usually what is called a single crystal blade. Now, what that means is that instead of being made out of regular metal, which is essentially metal is made out of tiny little crystals, millions of them, um, the metal is cooled in such a way that it behaves like a glass. So glass is not a crystalline material. Okay, when you that's why when you break a glass, it just like um, gets very sharp edges, and that's because it's fractured along in um, um, along the crystal. Um, you can make metal have one crystal if you cool it in a very special way. And so these blades are made in a very special way that means that when they cool from the manufacturing process, they form as one glassy crystal. And that gives you an advantage because um, when metal um, expands and continuously expands and creeps over time, that is usually because um, the distant uh, gaps between the crystals expand. If you don't have any crystals, if you just have one crystal, that problem goes away. That is a fairly big oversimplification of what actually happens, but it's enough to give you the, the gist of it. Um, so as I say, they're cooled um, with cooling air and they are single crystal blades. Um, the brighter among you are going to point out that this is a shrouded turbine blade. By that, I mean it has this fence affair at the top. Uh, yes, it is. Uh, shrouded turbine blades are still in use in most Rolls-Royce engines um, for a variety of reasons. There are advantages and disadvantages to them. Um, the Trent XWB97K, I believe, now has um, shroudless blades, but it's quite a lot more complicated to get a shroudless blade to work properly. Um, obviously, GE engines do, but they have other um, trade-offs that they've made for that. Um, tip clearance control system, um, again, this is just an example of some of the complexity that goes into these engines. So the gap between the turbine blade and the shroud of the engine needs to be as small as possible. Um, otherwise, air just leaks past the turbine tip. And instead of uh, powering the turbine, it just tur gets turbulent and the energy is lost and wasted. Um, I could talk for hours about tip clearance control because it was uh, the thing I was employed to design um, when I was at Rolls-Royce. Um, but suffice it to say that essentially we blow air from the compressor on the outside of the shroud of the engine and that causes it to shrink because it's cooling down and that shrinks it onto the turbine um, so that the gap between the blade and the shroud is minimized. Obviously, it's a lot more complicated than that in practice because it doesn't shrink uniformly. Um, you need to control when it shrinks and when it doesn't. The engine expands and contracts depending on how hard it's working, what its internal temperatures are, how long the disc has been soaking and so on and so forth. Um, but the general principle is that we control the gap by shrinking and growing the shroud by blowing air over it or not blowing air over it. Um, the fan blades at the front of the engine, um, now they are particularly interesting things. So um, different manufacturers make fan blades in different ways and almost none of the manufacturers are going to tell you how they make them. And I'm also not going to tell you how they make them. Um, these things are often not patented, they're just kept as trade secrets. Um, because if you patent something, somebody will just find a way of circumventing your patent. You, basically, it's published, so they know you can do it, they know how you're doing it, and they just need to find a manufacturing process that isn't covered by your patent. Whereas if you don't tell them, if you don't patent it, then they might not know how you do it. They have to buy a copy of your engine, they have to take it apart, find out how you've built it, then decide whether or not it's worth replicating. And of course, that happens all the time, and all the manufacturers do that to each other constantly. Um, but it takes a long time, and often it may or may not be worth it. Um, fan blades have to be pretty good. Um, on the right-hand side here, you can kind of see the evolution of them. I mean, these are um, early sort of 1970s type fan blades here, the CFM56 original fan blades. Um, 
they had what was called snubbers, these little wings on sort of two thirds away along the, along the blade, and they actually touch each other so that the, it, it's there to stop the blades sort of knocking into each other and vibrating because the early blades weren't that stiff. But you lose a lot of efficiency with snubbers. So, you know, the next sort of series, they had uh, a snubber less design here. And then the latest on the uh, Leap, which is the successor to the CFM56 engines, um, they are a carbon blade with a titanium leading edge, no snubbers. And you'll notice the blade is much fatter. And that means that they can have fewer blades. Um, but each blade is probably about the same weight. Now, by having a lighter blade, you get savings upon savings because the fan case around the outside of the fan has to be able to withstand a blade off incident. That's when a blade fractures. It's got to be able to keep the blade inside the engine. Um, if your blade doesn't weigh as much because it's lighter, then it won't have as much energy. That means your fan case doesn't have to be as strong. So you can have a much lighter fan case and so on. So if you save a little bit of weight on the fan blade, you can actually save quite a lot of weight on the engine overall. So the trend at the moment is very much towards um, composite fan blades, usually with a titanium leading edge for abrasion resistance, um, fatter, fewer blades. Um, Rolls-Royce doesn't have any composite fan blades in service, even though General Electric have since the 1990s with the GE90 series engines. There's a, a range of reasons for that. It's not automatically better to have a composite blade. Um, the advantage of titanium blades is that they can be made much more accurately. Um, the weight penalty is not as bad as you think, and the aerodynamic penalty for early um, composite blades was not great. Um, that said, I think Rolls-Royce are playing catch up now and trying to get a composite fan into service. You will know when they do because it's colored a rather fetching turquoisey color. Um, people often ask me how to start an engine. Um, the answer is usually similar for most engines. Um, underneath the engine, there is a thing called an auxiliary gearbox. Um, that auxiliary gearbox, depending on the engine, is usually connected to the high pressure uh, compressor, which is connected to the high pressure turbine. There are some exceptions to that. The Trent 1000 engine, which is the Boeing 787 engine, the auxiliary gearbox is driven by the intermediate pressure um, compressor. Um, that's mainly because of the amount of power they need to take off, because that engine has electric um, start and it also has um, the electric cabin pressurization, which means they need a much more powerful generator and so on. But anyway, on most engines, it is connected to the high pressure compressor. On the left here, we can see a typical auxiliary gearbox. Um, we get the radial drive shaft here from the high pressure compressor, and that goes into a sort of gear train down the bottom. And that gear train is connected to your ancillaries. So we've got, for example, a generator, we've got a hand turning um, access, that's just turn, it, turn the engine over um, by hand for maintenance. We have an air start motor. Most, most engines are started by air. That compressed air needs to come from the aircraft's compressed air system, which is usually driven by the aircraft's auxiliary power unit. Um, as I say, a very few gas turbines are started electrically. The Trent 1000 is a good example, um, but it's not that common. Um, you're going to have your fuel pumps, which are very complicated machines um, in their own right, various tachometers. You're going to have oil pumps. You're going to have all sorts of other equipment down there, um, which is driven by your auxiliary gearbox. It's a very, very important piece of kit and quite complicated as well. Um, it's also going to have oil filters, strainers, and all the rest of the gubbins that you need to keep the, um, keep the engine oil system um, operating well. I'm not going to go into the complexity of these diagrams, but I'm just going to mention the fact that fuel systems on these aircraft are very complicated, as are oil systems. Um, in fact, back in the Navy, I had to learn systems like this off by heart 
Um, I'm not going to pretend that I can still remember them because, of course, I can't. Um, if you want to know more about them, I'll stick a comment in the description and I'll go through one with you. Um, it's not, they're not as complicated now because computers have taken over a lot of the, the donkey work, but they still have a lot of proportional control valves, servo valves, um, basically different bits of pressure in fuel and or oil at different parts of the engine um, allow the fuel system to do what it needs to do. And usually what you're trying to do with a fuel system is stop the engine from overspeeding. Um, on the right, you've got an oil system. Um, oil systems are very, very important. Um, military engines have to have more complicated oil systems because the engines have to operate um, in every orientation, whereas civilian engines generally just have to operate, you know, in a standard flat configuration. You know, they might occasionally have to do a near vertical climb, but that's like a once in a operating lifetime um, thing. Um, so on most civilian aircraft, you wouldn't be able to fly upside down for any period of time because the, the oil would drain out of the tank. Um, but obviously you can on a military aircraft because they're, um, they're designed to allow that. Um, they also have to use quite special oil, obviously, to operate in high temperatures. And it may um, be relatively nasty stuff that you don't generally want to handle um, uh, too freely. Um, and that oil is fed to the bearings throughout the engine. Um, and the fuel pumps and other, other moving parts. And it's uh, constantly circulated, breathed, cooled, and put back. Usually the incoming fuel cools the oil, usually. Um, how good are modern engines? Um, they are really, really, really good. Uh, I'm not really going to dwell on this much more than just to say they're so good that most pilots today will go through their entire career without experiencing an engine failure. Now, that is obviously a very good thing. Um, it does have a minor downside in that when engine failures occur, you could argue that pilots are less experienced and less able to handle it. Obviously, they train in the simulator all the time, but it's very difficult to simulate the panic factor of, shit, I've lost an engine. Um, but I'd still rather that engines almost never failed than that pilots were very good at dealing with failed engines because they happen routinely, uh, which used to be the case. I mean, as I said, in the up to the mid 40s, it really wasn't unusual for a DC-8 or Constellation or something like that to take off with four piston engines and land with two or three. It was almost routine. Um, I saved this picture at the bottom because it's uh, it's actually a, a bear bomber, which has been in service since the 1950s. Um, and those turboprop engines are still turning. I mean, I'm sure they've reconditioned them many times, but they're still operating. And the F-22 below it, uh, its bypass engines are obviously much more modern. Um, I actually don't know how well they work because I don't know anything about F-22 engines, but it's a cool picture nonetheless. But modern engines are very good. They almost never fail. However, um, it's not entirely unknown. And uh, Rolls-Royce, no more than anyone else, is not immune to this. Um, this slide here shows an event known as QF32, Qantas Flight 32, um, happened some years ago. Um, it had uh, Rolls-Royce Trent 900 engines on it, which was a A380, um, and the engine literally blew up in midair. Um, now, usually when an engine um, disintegrates in the way that this one did, everybody dies. Uh, I really can't um, overemphasize the seriousness of this incident. Everybody should have died. I'm glad they didn't, but uh, on most instances when this happens, that would be the result. The reason they didn't was partly blind luck and partly because the A380 has a triple, triple spar wing. Um, and that meant that it, although it, the wing was severely damaged, it didn't drop off. Uh, what happened was an oil fire inside the engine um, raised the temperature slightly so that the intermediate, pre intermediate pressure shaft, which is the part that connects the intermediate pressure turbine um, to the intermediate pressure compressor, failed. The shaft snapped, basically. Because the shaft snapped, there wasn't any restriction on the high uh, intermediate pressure turbine um, because it wasn't driving the compressor anymore. So it just span faster and faster and faster until the disc, which is the part of the turbine that the um, blades are attached to. It's a really heavy piece of nickel. It's sort of 
a large dinner plate sized lump of nickel, it weighs about 80, 90 kilos, depending on the engine. That exploded due to centrifugal force, um, went through the airplane. Um, there's no way the engine casing can contain a disc. It's not designed to, you'd have to have like, you know, inches of titanium to do that. And obviously you wouldn't be able to fly if you did. Discs are not supposed to fail. Um, and uh, punctured multiple engine systems, multiple aircraft systems, hydraulics, um, instrumentation, fuel lines, and so on. Luckily, and again, by pure luck, it didn't go through the cabin um, and it didn't cause a rapid depressurization of the aircraft. Um, the long story short, the pilots managed to land the plane. Um, there is a really interesting report on the whole event. I can't do justice to it in a few minutes, but there were so many issues that led to that failure, design issues, manufacturing issues, servicing issues. Um, it should never have happened. Um, and it is a good example of how not doing your job as an engineer can potentially kill hundreds of people. Um, so that incident should never have happened. It did. Uh, everyone was very lucky, but on the positive side, um, lessons have been learned, the problems have been fixed, and that particular problem won't happen again, although, of course, others might. Um, so that's about all I'm going to talk about today. Uh, I'd like to say thank you very much for watching. Um, if you've got any questions, put them in the description below and uh, let me know what you think of the format and if you want me to do anything similar. Thanks very much.